Hey everyone, this is Afford Effects, and today we're going to be covering introducing and physically describing your characters and the rippling six packs, beautiful blue eyes, and perfect hair. First up, let's begin with the age old debate Do you describe your characters? This is broken into three camps describing your characters, not describing them at all, and the middle ground. Let's go over each of them and what they bring to the table. Describing your characters brings quite a bit to the table. It gives your reader a visualization to work off first and foremost. This means they can see a real flesh and blood character rather than a blur. This comes along with quite a few benefits. It allows the reader to differentiate characters more easily and it gives you the power to describe and also emphasize certain aspects of your character you want the reader to notice. This leads on to character change as well. Say as your story progresses, your character starts to get stubble. This can be used as a physical representation to show a little bit of hardships coming along. Without a description at all, this can be difficult to implement. On the other end of the spectrum, we've no description at all. This is a technique used to allow your reader to superimpose themselves upon your character. It also grants creative freedom to the reader to imagine their own look, which leads on to varying, pretty much limitless interpretations of that character. It gives more immersion at the cost of control. And finally, we have the middle ground. For my protagonist, I'm typically extremely light in detail. This gives moderate creative control and the immersive benefits of not describing them much for my reader. In other words, it's the best of both worlds. My advice is simple, the risk of your reader not being able to see the character at all is too big of a problem to ignore. Put in a description of a character unless you have a reason not to or you're very experienced. At the end of the day, it's a safe option, the middle ground. Instance description. This can be a single descriptive instance that you will apply towards a single character. It's all together and pretty much without breaks. Example. An elderly Asian woman stood at the top of the stairs, a frown etched onto her face. She was draped in a black cloak leaning on a gnarled walking stick. Her intelligent eyes scanned the room, causing many students at the front to shrink back. The crowd immediately fell into dead silence, her gaze proving the perfect catalyst. Comparative description. This method will pick characters or groups of characters against one another. For example, the first to step forward was a small girl who introduced herself as Ellie. She was barely half my height with black hair and dark eyes. I reached out to shake her small hand. The hulking finger beside her grunted and grabbed my arm, stopping me. He was at least five times taller than Ellie and covered in thick, knotted muscles. This method can be used to enhance characteristics, such as how large the man was to Ellie. This can make her seem even smaller or him even larger, as well as possibly showing the relationship to one another. The big guy seems very protective of her, and it's added depth to him before he's even said a word. Additionally, a comparative method can also be used to show similarities as well. A suit of armor completely covered Samuel's large frame. Behind him, his allies watched us with identical piercing gazes. They were at least as tall as Samuel, standing around seven foot tall. From their build, I assume they either lived in a gym, took a lot of steroids, or both. This example has shown off how large the entire group was, and it's also made Samuel feel like he's more a part of the group showing his alliances because he was described with them. This can even help humanize the rest of the group if you wanted them to be silent. This could be even used after an action scene where Samuel kicked ass to show the rest of the group are at least as strong as him, making them seem like more of a threat. There are a million different connotations you can use with comparative introductions, so experiment with them and have fun. It's a powerful tool not many authors make use of. Dripped introductions. Drip-fed introductions are scattered over a few lines to even a few pages. For example, he confidently strode across the room, smiling with a row of perfect white teeth. Other dialogue and writing. His brown eyes seemed to pierce me as he shook my hand. I couldn't breathe. He was like, oh my God, so good looking. Other dialogue and writing. His voice was as sweet as chocolate covered in honey. Other dialogue and writing. This method is popularly used in creating romantic tension or building a larger physical presence, but these are only the main things. It has a multitude of uses. Additionally, in busy scenes, this method can be used to break up the description so it doesn't slow the scene down too much. Mix and match. Lastly, do not be afraid to mix and match these methods. You don't need to pick one and stick to it. You can start by dripping information, move on to comparative, and end with a light descriptive instance. It's entirely up to you. When to describe physical features. For your protagonist, you're gonna to wanna to describe them as soon as humanly possible. For other characters, you wanna describe them as soon as you see them. This gives a more natural flow to the writing and gives you an immediate look to go along with the snappy, introductive dialogue. This is the standard rule. The only exceptions are high energy scenes. You should rarely, if at ever, describe much appearance during a scene with a lot going on. Your MC will not gaze at a love interest, see blue eyes under a hail of bullets, or describe how great and luscious their hair was in an intense sword fight. Reserve your description for the earliest possible low energy scene. What do I write? Most new writers focus on a few features they see in their head and vomit them onto a page. 
Below is a list of all possible features. Typically, I pick around two to five depending on how important the character is, or how I'm feeling, or the genre of course, but don't you dare make the age old mistake of picking them at random. Character descriptions can be a powerful tool for you to use. They can allow you to say something about the character's personality, and a lot of new writers miss this completely. Don't just spout off natural features. These can seem very cardboard cutty and only give a one dimensional look into the character, when it could be so much more. Let's do an example from a lot of books. The typical guy. He's male, has beautiful blue eyes, he has short black hair, muscular but not bulky, we can't have him too sexy. Tall obviously, really expensive casual clothing though, that just drape off him but seem to hold his frame perfectly. What beyond sex appeal does this actually give the reader? Yes, they're good looking. And so what? Is that all you want your character to be, a good looking guy? What actually, if anything, can we get from this? I've read this description a thousand times too many. Let's make another character 3D. How about a new character our MC is meeting? We've already decided that they're gonna be the comic relief of the book. What features do I wanna point out? So for this one, I've made him male, big smile, mischievous eyes, messy unkept brown hair, and baggy worn clothes. This comic relief character has some stereotypical features. He's got the eyes, the smile, you know, all the cookie cutter stuff. The real interesting details are the worn baggy clothing and the messy brown hair. Why does he have these? Because he's poor. This description could be used to explain the character as being poor as a showing tool as well as an introduction. Later I could add a rich arch rival who contrasts this and because the character looks a certain way he notices it. Think Harry Potter and Ron and Draco. If it's good enough for Riley making her stacks of millions, it's good enough for us. This is only me scratching the surface though. With time and effort, you can think and plan your character to look a certain way, affecting how he looks to the reader, which in turn can be used to emphasize or contrast his character in certain ways, or even how other characters view him, meaning his interactions will be different. It's got a million different uses. You can learn a million times more about a person from the conscious and unconscious choices they've made. If someone has bags under their eyes, it shows they're not getting much sleep. Why is that? Do they have tattoos, piercings, where, why, what do they represent? In real life, we make assumptions off these things, and the same should go for your book. Making a real life flesh and blood character is the same process. Physical description's length. Typically, as a rule of thumb, you wanna keep it short and sweet. Your description should never sound like a police report. I have a rule for this. For side characters, I have one to two lines, and for important characters, I can go from two to five. This is what it typically takes me. If it's taking longer than that for any character, you're doing something wrong. Exceptions for this are in the romance, horror genre, or whenever you're describing an extremely important character like a main boss. Most readers will expect this and they'll understand, but if it's just normal characters, you don't want to go crazy on it. Flaws. Human beings have flaws. Something that we all know. Even the world's top models have flaws in their body somewhere. And perfect people are boring. Nothing is less memorable than a perfect person in a book. In books, we visualize fantasy as readers, which nearly always is better than real life. You don't need to go crazy as an author scrubbing away all the flaws from your character. Your reader will do a lot of that themselves. Allow your female character's hair to go frizzy in the rain. That's kind of cute. Allow your male character to get bags under their eyes after a week in the wild. That's natural. And once again can be used to show a progression of hardship in the story. Flaws are what we notice more in human beings than the good things. So use that to your advantage. Amount of characters to introduce. You want to keep this number as low as possible in one instance. So for example, do not walk into the mansion of Lord Dracula and introduce 15 different characters at once. We're not going to remember Alice, Jacob, Jake, Chloe, Darren. We're not going to remember all these people in one go. Not only will it make it difficult to differentiate your characters when you get on, or make them very special or noticeable in any way, or to give them enough time to use introductive dialogue in a quippy, interesting way, it also means it's really difficult to keep up and slows the writing down to an absolute snail's pace. Try to avoid this. So, for example, to fix that, you'd walk in with the butler who opened the door. You'd talk to him, learn a bit about the surroundings, a creepy thing happens, and you'd walk upstairs and meet the other maid, who's a really creepy character, and then you get to see how they bounce off each other. Have a slow drip progression of introductions rather than one big massive explosion. There's always ways around introducing people or too many people at once, so find them and use them. Descriptions and relationships. Physical descriptions depend on your protagonist's relationship with the character being introduced. This depends on a POV being used, of course. If it's your MC's dad, they probably aren't going to say his hair is like a beautiful silver fox, begging to be stroked, just like his rippling six-pack. 
It's their dad and that's kind of creepy. This can be another tool to explain the relationship of the MC to the character being introduced. For instance, your MC meets up with a female friend of 10 years. The MC won't think, she's got a great rack. Mm. They're long-term friends, they won't think of each other like that. Unless that's the relationship you're aiming for. This technique can be used to show what your MC really thinks and what the relationship in their mind is to the other introduced character. Romance authors have this nailed down and if they can do it, I'm sure we can. Things to avoid. Too many cliches, metaphors, and analogies. Now, there's nothing wrong with these tools. They are unbelievably powerful. But if I hear his eyes were as blue as the sea, I'm actually going to jump out of a window. I'm so tired of hearing the same old cliches. If you are going to use metaphors and analogies, please make them unique. Please make them something that associates to the character or the story or something. Do not just throw them in. They make you look amateurish as hell. They are unbelievably eye-rollingly boring. And another thing to note on this is do not use the same descriptive instance too much when introducing characters. So uh, eyes as black as onyx, you can use that once. You can describe them maybe two, three times throughout the book. Oh, it's black eyes looked over. That's fine. No problems. But do not use them too frequently either. Sorry, pet peeves, guys. I'm going to shut up. And that's it for the video, ladies and gentlemen. If you did make it this far, I want you to do something for me. Just, just a little something. I want you to go down to the comment section and I want you to introduce yourself or introduce a random character in a weird and wonderful way using the rules in the video. Now, try to make these as strange and obscure as possible so anyone that doesn't make it to the end has no absolute fucking idea what we're talking about. That would make me smile. A little bit of confusion is always fantastic. So guys, I can't wait to read these comments and as always, have a great day. Best of luck in the book and take it easy.